I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. <laughs> What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Quit That Sound Out Podcast. Once again, I'm Josh Shovinoff. He's the one and only Angel Ortega. My oh my, it is a packed week for combat sports, ladies and gentlemen. UFC 269 fight week ongoing. Dustin Poirier, Charles Oliveira, Amanda Nunes, Julian Pena. Two title fights going down on ESPN Plus in Vegas on Saturday night. Before all of that, as well as talking about some Bellator, some UFC stuff, um, outside of obviously UFC 269, talk to you guys real quickly about Rogue Energy. Uh, obviously, Rogue Energy sponsored the show for a long time. If you've been listening, you know about them. Amazing energy drink company. If you win 10% off your orders, you go to sound off at checkout. Let's go to sound off at checkout for 10% off of all energy needs at rogueenergy.com. Obviously, tremendous company. Guys, it's a holiday season. Use code sound off. Get, get your wife something. Get your friends something. It's an amazing gift for all comers. And, uh, obviously, just go ahead and use code sound off. Get 10% off. Amazing sponsor of the program. We appreciate them. And Angel, my guy. Last Saturday night, the ageless wonder that is Jose Aldo in the main event at UC Vegas 44 from Las Vegas, Nevada, in the UC Apex. This was this was an awesome fight, man. Um, it was not fight of the night material. That went to Cheyenne, Vilmos, uh, Mallory Martin. But still, it was a tremendous fight. Jose Aldo, Rob Font. Jose Aldo picks up the decision win, 50-45, 50-45, 49-46 being the scorecards. Full credit to Rob Font, man. I thought he looked good early, and I thought we were going to see uh, it was going to be a rough night at the office. Rob Font came out with tons and tons of pressure, and then Jose Aldo near the end of the first round just decided, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to win this fight. And he just started unloading bombs, and Rob Font never recovered from that point onward from the first round. Um, he just lost every round past that. Uh, what are your thoughts about Jose Aldo's performance, and also moving forward in the division? That's three wins in a row now. He's still, I mean, he's going to be 30. He's 35, excuse me, and years after we thought he was past his prime, he still keeps on winning these fights, dude. What, what were your thoughts about his performance? Also, just kind of his his standing point in the division. I mean, dude, what what can you say, right? Uh, one of my favorite phrases to say on this show when I'm left kind of speechless is, he did it again, man. He fucking did it again. He had uh, probably in recent time. Is that the greatest Jose Aldo performance we had in a while? Uh, I'd say without a doubt. I thought I thought uh, his model and verify was impressive, but not not crazy. You it wasn't know? like and this. It wasn't like M- this. Munoz is a really good performance. That uh, was but that was solid. It gave it, I think that was the next step up from this, though. Yeah, this is this is severe step up, especially considering what Rob Font did before this. Yes, you know so his winning streak. Obviously, a good little look there for Jose Aldo, and it was just it was just fun, and he he dropped him. Dropped him? Did he drop him multiple times? I think he dropped him four times. Yeah, which, fucking insanity, right? <laughs> With the hands. And it, it was just so, and then he just, it, it, he did kind of get tired there, which is kind of a worry, because there was a point where he just kind of like laid on him. <laughs> I think they both were tired, dude. <laughs> like, honestly. So I can't really hate on them both. I can't really give anybody the blame there, because I think they both really just put it all out there. But man, it was, uh, that's fucking fun, man. And I think, you know, the big question right now is, what is next for Jose Alda? What is next for Jose Aldo? That's the interesting point. I think the fight that to make, really considering everything, there's no other fight to make. And also, it's kind of like one of those weird dream fights you never thought would happen. TJ Dillashaw versus Jose Aldo has to happen. And I understand that they said they were going to give TJ a title shot. Um, obviously, because he beat, quote-unquote, beat Corey Sandhagen. But, um, dude, it, just the way the division's lining up, obviously, Aljo and Piotr Jan... Actually, I got an idea. I actually don't know. Oh, what's your, what's your idea? Go ahead. I feel about we finally get the fight we want to see, the fight of legends. We finally get Dominic Cruz versus Jose Aldo. Well, that's all dependent on if Dom wins this weekend. If Dom wins this weekend, I'm totally down. But the thing is that you're still going to have that log jam with TJ. Yeah. So doing this would kind of take one of those Aldo or TJ out of the running. But I do think we have to see Dom versus Aldo by the time their careers wrap. That's a I, WEC I, dream fight for back I in the day. I can't die and not see Dominic Cruz fight, not fight Jose Aldo. And by the way, I need that shit for five rounds, but also, I, I honestly, at this point in their careers, not even because um, Dom's bad. I think Dom is still very good. I think Dom still might, I think he has the potential to still be a top five guy in the division. 
I don't think he'll ever be a title guy again. But I think this is the style, good. though, stylistically. That's stylistically, cool. I think Aldo beats the hell out of him, dude. I mean, you saw in his, uh, not his last fight, but um, two fights before against Henry Cejudo, his legs got beat up, man. And, that's supposed uh, to all the throws them though. I mean, we have to see, man. It's, it's, it's all dependent of a lot of things. Like, that's why we have to see that matchup. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. So I'll go and I'll put that forth. If, 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 uh, if Cruz wins, I think you can do the Aldo fight. Fucking book it, it. If he wins. Fucking okay. book it. Well, a lot of it just depends on the timeline for TJ and also the timeline for Aljo. Cause that division is so if he wins, fucked up. If he wins Saturday, I need, I, I hope, I don't know if he does it. Call out Jose Aldo. Fuck it. Look, dude, I like it. I like the fight. I'm just. I want know, it, dude. There's such you know? a log jam. I mean, Dominic it. Cruz is calling out the wrong people. I mean, he's calling out DC, dude, the daddest man on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> I saw. I'm not sure if you saw my tweet about this. Um, it was like because I saw DC uploaded the video of him talking with Dom, and I was like, so you're really you're really gonna talk to Dom in two days after two days when you guys got beef, but you've been ducking Max Holloway for years. <laughs> Hashtag daddest man on the planet. <laughs> I, I did see that. Dude, it's funny because uh, I saw another meme that it was like what uh what Dominic Cruz thinks about a uh, DC on commentary and his DC with a beer and a cigarette. <laughs> a meme never Dude, dies. I Dude. legitimately I never really um was on Dom's side. That thing I thought it was a bit of an early stoppage, but I also thought it was fun until I saw Clay Guida, which we'll talk about this in a minute. But Clay Guida's fight this weekend where he got the shit kicked out of him and hey, Keith Peterson just let it keep on going. Never die. <laughs> We'll get into he it. He just though. let it go. He just let it go. Um, so I was like, you know what? Dom's got to be at home right now. Furious. <laughs> he's breaking fucking his windows at his house right now. He's punching walls and shit, watching Keith Page or something. That fight go. Um, but yeah, dude, back to the main event. I thought it was a good fight. There's a lot of stuff that, that, that um, you know, a lot of different directions it can go. I feel bad for Rob Font. I'm not going to lie with you because I thought coming out early, man, I thought it looked really, really good. I thought he's kind of going full pressure. That's kind of the way to beat Aldo at this point. At least that's kind of the, 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 the blueprint. And he just got caught. And I feel like once he got caught in that first round, he never recovered. Um, he could never really get back to square one. Which he had a lot of momentum going. And he got dropped within, like, the what, last 15 seconds? Something like that? Yeah, dude. And then they had the submission of him. So, I mean, it was a heck of a night for him. It was a it was a rough night, honestly. But uh, hopefully he can recover from that because he's a fun guy. Definitely do mm-hmm. want to keep seeing him in the mix. And then Aldo, obviously, dude, we talked about him. We can praise him all night. I mean, we know what he did. I mean, it, 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 we've seen it. it. It's there. Honestly, if you haven't seen the fight, go rewatch it because that's honestly how good it was. Like mm-hmm. I told Josh, when you have when you have people who don't keep up with MMA getting excited over a fight, that's how you know it's a good fight. Yeah, and you know what, dude? This is this is vintage Aldo down to a T. Because I feel like Aldo, we've kind of had the criticism for a while now. He he's fallen in love with his hands. That's not necessarily a bad thing as long as he does like he he does his amazing body work. Feels, he even mixes in some leg kicks. I feel like this is like the perfect auto performance. He mixed in leg kicks. He went to the body a lot. And his hook to the body is my favorite body work in MMA. Like the Jeremy Stevens type where he just kind of fucking arcs into it. He did it a lot in this fight too. And it's, he, he's kind of doing that less and less. But god damn, dude. He can generate some huge power behind those shots when he goes to the body. And that, you can tell it has an effect on people. Um, so yeah, dude. This is a vintage all, Jose Aldo performance. And full credit to him. Get got the win. We'll see what happens from here. This division is, I've normal circumstances, he'd get a title shot because, uh, you know, three wins over top seven-ish guys, um, which is mind-blowing to think about. 15 years into his career, he's still doing this shit, but, you know, we'll see what happens moving on. Um, co-main event, dude, also a tremendous fight. Uh, Rafael Faziev defeating Brad Riddell via third on TKO. The first time in Brad Riddell's career, kickboxing, MMA, boxing, that he loses via TKO. How about that? Um, that third round, it was a back from the first two rounds. I know that all the judges had Rafael Fiziev up uh, two rounds to nothing. I thought that was one of those situations where he was just kind of edging him out. I thought they were relatively close rounds, but they were relatively close but clear rounds. Going to that third round, though, dude, that, that spinning back kick, he hit him with it. And Brad Riddell had this weird reaction. He put his hands up like he could tell he was buzzed and you could tell he was fucked, but he didn't know what to do. Looks like he tried to call time. I'm not sure if you caught that. I saw that. Yes, we all made that joke. Like, he he tried to call time. It's like he had like a fencing response, but like standing up. It was so bizarre. Anyways, he went down, got the knockout finish. High five, Fiziev. Dude, this kid, man, this fucking kid. I say, called kid, it Josh. 28 years old. Called it Josh. Um, you did call it. You actually you, you moved up one fight, so you're getting you're you're getting closer to beating him. We have like two events left, so um yeah, dude. Now you're I gotta go hard. You got hard. He's 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 uh, ranked number eleven now, dude. 
What do you think about his performance, his stand, standing in the division? What just, that fight was incredible. And to beat a guy like Brad Riddell like that, so durable. I mean, what do you think about that? Fucking statement, dude. That's what you want. I mean, he's a fucking dangerous guy. I mean, that's what you want to do against, against a guy who obviously they had history together. And, uh, I mean, he showed his skill set. He, like I said, he put out a guy for the first time ever in his combat career. It's obviously a fucking, you know, in a weird way, it's kind of an honor. Obviously not an honor for Brad Riddell, right? Obviously, yeah. you, never, you never want to get finished, but, you know, you got to think, you know, all those, you know, and obviously shout out to Brad Riddell for always avoiding that. You know, it's such a hard thing to do. I mean, there's very few guys of their combat career who avoid ever getting put out or ever losing to, you know what I mean? And it's just how it goes sometimes, man. He got caught. It happens. I mean, it was just, it was just, you know, they, were, they had solid rounds. They're going back and forth. Just he and, you know, the other guy ended up being a better man. And at this moment in time, I think the better fighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, entirely. And that's not to say that uh, Brad Riddell cannot come back from this and maybe one day they have a rematch. I can see it actually happening just by virtue of these guys both being relatively young in the division and lightweight being in a weird place where um, obviously a lot of those guys are kind of aging out. I mean, as much as we love the title fight this week, both those guys, I don't think they're like on the downside with their career. They're both like early slash mid 30s, but a lot of that division's aging out. I could see them having a rematch somewhere down the line on that that night, though. Yeah. I mean,. It makes me feel sad, dude. I'm not gonna lie with you. Seeing like all these guys that we've watched for years, like it's okay like, though. It's okay. We'll get we'll get the new generation. We'll get new names, and we'll be there for it too, dude. I mean, we're I mean, we're, we're gonna be growing up. The guys coming in are gonna be the guys who are our age. You know, what I, mean? I know, so which be, is weird, but it'll be really relatable. You know, there'll be a lot. Yeah. there'll be a lot there. You know, yeah. I mean, I'll put it like this, Josh. The guys we have right now are not the guys we're gonna have in five years. Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, if you look at like the top dogs in that division, like. Um, even Makachev, what, like early 30s, mid 30s? Yeah. Poirier, mid 30s, Oliveira, early 30s. I mean, Poirier is almost out the door, though, and he's pretty much said that. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty much said that. Uh, Henry Sudo said he thinks that if, if, uh, Poirier wins this weekend, he's gonna walk away. I would not be surprised. Um, which would be a fucking epic send off. Yeah. I mean, what, Connor's like 33, 34? I mean, it, it feels, it feels weird, but yeah, I can see these guys, they're both in their late 20s. I can see them. How you, how all all our legends are almost gone, dude. Like, we have Jose Aldo, Dom Cruz. Ferguson's like 38, I think. Yeah, like, they're, so. they're, they're, they're going. But that's okay, man. That's just how the sport is. That is. But, yeah, man, overall, a nice a nice win by Rafael Fazeev. He's going to move up the division, like I said, now up to 11. I think it's weird he's not higher than that, but whatever. Um, slow climb, I guess. Uh, as far as the rest of the card goes, my guy, what are some of the other fights? I think that, uh, you know, we talked about, like, before we were recording – Probably the best top to bottom card of the year as, as far as a fight night goes. Obviously, fight nights are much different standard than a pay per view. But what are some of the fights you particularly want to go and highlight? Hey, Josh, let's just start making our way down, dude. We just got to keep it rolling, dude. That's how it. That's how it's gonna be. All right, yeah. Let's go ahead and let's keep it rolling, my man. Um, the fight that I said that I hated, actually. Yes. Um, we both did. Jamal, Jamal Hill, Jimmy Crute. Um, Jamal Hill, dude, knocks out Jimmy Crute. Put, I don't know if you put him out cold, but it was rough, dude. 48 seconds in. It's devastating. He landed 48 seconds in, he looked like a fucking wreck. Like, he went through World War II by the end of it. You know what uh, I compared him? it to? I compared what? it to someone being allergic by bees getting stung. That's, That's it looks exactly like what it looked like. Yeah. His, his eyes looked like they had an allergic reaction. Dude, he, uh... Yeah, dude, it was rough. I mean, he broke his... I think he broke his orbital and his nose. Fuck. I mean, great win for Jamal Hill. Staff for Jimmy Crew, because obviously... We're all Jimmy so we all appreciate Jimmy Crew here, you know. Yeah, and they're both and they're both coming off losses. Now he's he's back to back losses. He's twenty five, and that's so much damage to take so early in your career, dude. I mean, that's just it happens though. Fucking devastating, bro. Yeah, I know it happens. But still, it is it is def- it's definitely rough, dude. I hate that fight, but yeah, hell of a win though. I th- still think Jamal Hill. I think he just got caught. I think really think he. I think he just got caught against Paul Craig. I can see him coming back. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and. Keep it all moving, dude. The highlight of the night for me personally. Um, well, one of the highlights of the night. Obviously, this is this is honestly a feel good night for for MMA guys, right? Um, that's probably the Jimmy Crude situation, I guess I should say. Um, Clay Guida, dude. We mentioned earlier getting his ass kicked. There's no other way around it. He was getting annihilated um, by another old man in Leonardo Santos. Fucking almost could have been ranked <laughs> Leonardo yeah, Santos. Yeah, right. So close, and dude, he he got annihilated. He's getting beat up on the feet, and somehow makes it into round two where Leandro Santos is just, he's fucking gas because he's 41 years old. 
Uh, he's Clay Guida, 40. Guy. <laughs> um, Clay takes him down and submits the fucking, like, fourth degree black belt. I mean... The, the fucking world champion. Actually, I don't even know he's a world champion. Yeah, I've heard he's... I don't know how high he is, like, in terms of, like, world ranks. He's very fucking good, though. Um, no, no, he has great jiu-jitsu. Yeah. yeah, so him getting submitted... <sighs> when it wasn't a situation like... you know Someone, how, like, fluffy, someone fluffy made some Hernandez? good money that night. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know how, like, Fluffy Hernandez submitted... Oh, man, I can't remember his name. Uh, Rodolfo Rivera. Yes, correct. Um... And that was more situation where, like, he beat him up on the feet, and he was also tired. This is a case, like, Leonardo Santos was, like, tired, but he wasn't dead tired. And he also hadn't gotten beat up on the feet or anything. Clay just took him down and submitted him immediately. Like, it was bizarre. Um, but, yeah, dude, the Hall of Famer, dude, still doing it. And uh, I know he said he wants to fight Nate Diaz next, which is not going to happen. Um, Sag. But, dude, I'm so I'm so happy for that kid. Uh, that kid, he's 40 years old. But, yeah, 37th win of his career. Hall of, Flame, Hall of Famer, Clay Guida. He's going for 40, it. dude. I think he's going for his 40 wins. I think he's going for I think him and Jim Miller both said they're trying to go for UFC 300. They're trying to make it to that card. I don't think it's possible, though. I think it would be in 2024, if I remember correctly. So Someone, someone said the date. John Anik was on the, on the was on one of the broadcasts, and he said the year would be. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Well, let me see if I can. Well, it's laid out. They have the dates laid out, so. They do. Date for UFC 300. Yeah, I can't find anything. It'd be in 2024, 2025. So. Yeah, and these guys are, they'd be like, what, mid-40s by then? Yep. Yeah, not happening, sadly. Uh, I don't know, man. Maybe Jim Muller can do it. If there's anybody can do it, it'd be him. But. I mean, they're, I mean, they're not getting knocked out, which is the good thing, which makes it possible for them. But still, dude, it's still kind of sus. I don't. It know. is. It's definitely. It's you know, time passes quick. Whenever I mean, those guys are gonna have to fight each other at UFC 300, if anything. Oh yeah, for sure. That's the last but, fight, dude. I mean, they both they fought once before, and I thought that was gonna be like a really fun fight between old, two old vets. Jim Miller just whooped his ass. So how long ago uh, was that though? That was in 2019. It was on the. It was a co-main event. The Colby uh, Lawler. Maybe it'd be different now. Maybe, maybe. Um, but, dude, my other personal feel-good moment of the card, Chris Curtis, dude. That was a good feel moment. I, I, I'm not sure how he's not ranked. It kind of pisses me off. Wait, he's, he's not he's, after that win? He's not ranked. Dude, who does he fight next year? Because he's definitely going to fight a ranked opponent after this, right? I mean, he, he's he got to. He should be ranked now. The fact that he's not is pretty fucking mind-blowing, considering the fact that he beat two dudes who were, like, on the outskirts of being ranked. Like, are you telling me, like, he shouldn't be... I mean, if you look at like, the last three guys in the division that are ranked, right? 15, 14, 13. Chris Weidman, Kevin Holland, Edmund Shavazian. I legitimately think you could put Chris Curtis at number like 12, number 13, over it'd those be, guys. Yeah, and it'd be, I think it'd be perfectly reasonable. I mean, knockout wins over Phil Hawes, and then also on this card, he scored a knockout win over Brendan Allen, who is like right on the outskirts. Well, put it like this. He's not fighting Edmund. He's, Kevin Holland's making a weight move. He's not going to fight Chris Weidman. I don't think they'll put him against Nazarene. Kelvin is a weird spot. I don't think he'll fight Kelvin. Yeah, I don't think Darren Till is going to fight anytime soon. I think he'll fight a guy like Uriah Hall very soon. Mm. Fight like a guy Uriah Hall. Maybe find himself in a fight with... Oof, I don't know. Near the top, then it gets a little rough because those are hard fights to get. Yeah, well, I mean, you know who Kevin Holland's going to fight? Have you heard this news? Dude, ideas, right? Like, Nick fucking... Diaz. Fucking weird, dude. I don't get that. I don't get it at all either. Um, but they're trying to make that fight at 170 from what I've heard. Apparently, from what I've heard, they're not too close to making it happen. But Kevin Holland wants it. So I wonder know. why him out of everybody. I think he said that he's got. He said he's got beef with Nick. Not sure why. I guess he said something happened to like a contender series fight or something. I don't know. When he was there with one of his boys. Yeah. So things were. You know how the, the the Diaz boys are. Um, uh, so yeah. Stalking um, motherfucker. Stockton, motherfucker, Stockton. Um, but yeah, dude, I, you know that's a weird fight. Yeah, Chris Curtis should be ranked. Got the got the knockout win on on this card. Tremendous like knockout I said, win. He needs a push, dude. He can't be the waiting. only one of our the only one of our boys that didn't get the win is Mickey Gall. Honestly, um, and it was such a weird fight. I don't think he shot for a single takedown. Uh, well, you know he like we talked about it, dude. Didn't have Matt Brown there. Matt Brown was supposed to be on this card and his coach, mm. and uh, well, he had COVID, so. I'm sure they played it, it played it played a factor to an extent. I don't know how much better it would have been, but you know what I mean. I'm, I'm sure maybe it fucked with him mentally. Maybe he 
he was like, fuck, man, I, I don't have my guy here. I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? They had they had to use the assistant coach. I don't know who was there. I don't know how, what they ended up doing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it played a factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we'll see what happens. Um, as far as the, the rest of the card goes, um, Manal Cup. Cape? I'm not, I'm still not sure how you pronounce his name. I've heard both at this point. Yeah, so regardless though, gonna knock out Windu. This is, this is the, the guy that we expected whenever he came in from Ryzen. This is entirely what we expected. Uh, his second knockout win in a row. I first say round as well. Exactly, first round, ranked number 14 now. Love to see that, still only 28 years old. And he's that blood that we need in a division that, you know, we kind of need it, dude. Um, you, know, you, you gotta give him credit too, cause it's four fights in one year. Yeah. Like, Which is really impressive. The two, the two were rough, right? He, 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 he lacked performances in those, but we knew, and you could have even, and then the split decisions in uh, Matias Nicolau that I thought he won, but, you know, he ended up, you know, he missed out on it because he didn't put enough, uh, yeah, he didn't, he put, didn't put out more, had the Pantoja loss, which obviously that fucking sucks, but once again, at his own fault, I don't know if he would have necessarily won that with more output, but still he didn't make it close enough to do that. Mm-hmm. And he had the weight miss last time too, which sucked. But no, yeah. no weight was missed this time. So Correct. he got he got everything this time. He got the weight on. He uh, got a knockout. Yeah, he did Uncle, everything right this time. Uncle, Uncle Dana happy. Uncle Dana happy. I'm happy to see it. He's ranked number 14 now. Love to see him in. Um, as far as the rest of the card goes, Brian Barberina got a, picked up a nice win. This guy, man, he's kind of man. I'm not sure what comparison I could make for him. Maybe the Matt Brown of the modern era. I know Matt Brown's still around, but like Matt Brown back in the day was just a guy that would fight anybody, give the top guys rough problems, and knock out you know the, the smaller ranked guys. And here he is. He picked up a nice win. Um, Brian Barbary did rather, so that's probably the best comparison I can make for him. And uh, I love to see it. I know that like on fight week he was like, I'm flying in. I don't, I don't have an opponent yet because he's supposed to fight Matt Brown. He's like, I'm gonna fight somebody though, so they better get me someone. <laughs> and they got Darion Weeks, and that was a pretty fun fight, dude. Um, Cheyenne Ville, uh, Vimas? What's Formerly the name situation? Che- what happened there? Do you know? Formerly, um, Cheyenne Buys. She got a divorce. Her and, uh, Mr. Mr. JP Buys are no longer together? Correct. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. Uh, poor JP Buys, man. Obviously, I don't know his situation, but I remember watching him on, I want to say he fought in the Contender Series and he looked really fucking good. Um, and then he, his 2021, he got knocked out, uh, lost to Montel Jackson in the fight where he got dropped the most times in UFC history without getting finished. And then he proceeded to leave his wife or have his wife leave him. So, well, who knows what happened there? We don't know the whole story. But. Uh, according to, <laughs> anyways, not going to get into that. That's just oh, there's a story. Really there's a story. Um, I apparently tell, me she left him. tell me afterwards. I'm actually, well, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's confirmed, but yeah, apparently she left him. Um, <laughs> She posted on Instagram as a messy divorce. She looked good, though. She looked really, really good. Um, she seems to be evolving, too. She's only 26. Her first fight in the UFC against Montserrat Ruiz was just a complete shit show. Since then, she got a knockout win. She looked good here against Mallory Martin. So good for her, man. Uh, yeah. William Knight, Alonzo Menafield, both uh, first-team all-body, got a nice... <laughs> put on a fun wrong. fight. Put on a fun wrong. fight. <laughs> you know, we had girls fighting on this card, and even they... And you could even argue the guys looked the best that I bought these <laughs> Entirely. First team all body, William Knight, Alonzo Metafield. Really fun fight, dude. Really, really fun fight. Um, Claudio Puelles got a nice submission win against Chris Gritzmacher. And then also, lastly, just shows how good this card is. And we've talked about almost every single fight on it, dude. Uh, Vince Morales is going to knock a win over my boy, Luis Smolka. Hated to see it, but, you know, it is what it is. That's how, that's how the cards go, man. Um, Vince Morales, dude, just a hell mean? of a knockout. Face planted, the poor guy. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. But moving on, dude, the card this weekend, tremendous. Um, you know, we argue a lot about what is the best pay-per-view card of the year. This is up there. I'm not sure if it's number one, but it's really fucking up there, bro. Um, you fucking I was know it, Josh. You fucking know it, bro. In the main events. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Uh, in the main event. Charles Dubronx Oliveira, the UFC's lightweight champion, defending against the uncrowned champion, Dustin the Diamond Poirier. Both the, it's honestly a little bit crazy these guys have not fought to now, but um, given how long they've been in the UFC and they, you know, both had time at featherweight, regardless of now they're fighting at lightweight. 
for the UC Lightweight Championship, dude. Just an absolute tremendous fight. I know Dustin's a pretty sizable favorite, actually, going into the fight this weekend. What do you think about the fight? What do you think about the matchup? And who do you got coming away with the belt on Saturday night? Dude, I mean, finally, we see Dustin fighting for the title once again. It took a little while. I, like I said, dude, after Habib retired, I thought Dustin was the king of the 155 division without his crown. I mean, when you look at it, dude, I mean, he has, as far as, like, his resume is the best out of the 155 division right now. I mean, he's beat Carmen McGregor, Dan Hooker, Max Holloway, Eddie Alvarez, Justin Gaethje, Anthony Showtime Pettis, Jim Miller, Bobby Green, Joe Duffy, Yancy Madero, Diego Ferreira. You, you name it, and he's fought him. Obviously, uh... It's been a it's been a hell of a run, man. It's been a hell of a career. You know his his one his one loss in in that you know little stint there was a uh, Michael Johnson and Habib Michael Johnson who it's crazy right out of all uh, you know it's crazy that you have in those losses guys like Cub Swanson the Korean Zombie Carmichael and then Habib and then you have Michael Johnson in the mix but you know that's just how life goes sometimes right. Mm-hmm. But uh, as far as now, man, we, we stand here and and we have. Uh, these guys were meant to fight, man. Charles Oliveira has been in the UFC forever. 32 years young. Turned 32 this year, man. You know, he's going to have to defend this title for the first time ever in his career. In a fight where I think there's a low. He's had... What's the proper word? He's had... I think people will kind of have their doubts about him. I don't think they doubt him, but they have doubts about him. Right? Because mm-hmm. I think if, if you genuinely follow the sport, you know that Dustin is... The guy at 155. Let's be real, Josh. I mean, no Habib, right? Dustin is the 155 guy right now. I mean, can you agree with me on that? He's he's the most um, accomplished 155 guy. I'll say that. But he is the guy, though, right? At 155 right now, he is the guy. A lot of people do view him as the champion, the uncrowned champ, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now he finds himself as in the position to be the guy, you know, officially, you know, with the crown, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And I feel like stylistically, I mean, this is a pick'em fight. I'm gonna be 100% with you. I think it's still a pick'em fight. I think there's a there's a way for Charles Lover for for him to win. I think there's a there's a way he gets it done. And as well, I think there's a way Dustin Poirier wins this fight. That's why I think it's a pick'em fight. You know, I I, I uh, but if I'm gonna be honest with you, I think I think this is I think Dustin Poirier gets his crown, man. I think he does it. I think he finishes late. I think it's gonna be in the third or fourth round, potentially even the fifth. I don't see it going to distance. Not to say Charles Oliveira can do it. I can see a submission coming out of Charles Oliveira. I actually even see a finish coming out of Charles Oliveira because he surprised me in that Michael Chandler fight. Mm. I'm picking Dustin Poirier. Picking the diamond to finally get his crown, dude. I, I get it, dude. And um, Oh, shit. <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't know what you're going to hit me with here. No, no. I'm just saying, like, I get, like, he's been working so hard for such a long time. And I, I long, I, I said for a while now. That um, even whenever the first fight happened, whenever Habib said back in October of 2020 that he was done fighting, they should have immediately made Conor Poirier 2 for the lightweight title. I don't know why they didn't, because Dana had this weird obsession where he followed Habib around for like a really an uncomfortable amount of time. Like, he, do you remember this? Up until like May, he was still trying to get him to fight, um, and it was it was kind of uncomfortable. Not gonna lie, but <laughs> they should have made that fight. Um, for the lightweight title. I think you could have even argued that the trilogy fight should have been for the title over Chandler Oliveira. Um, and so in a lot of ways, that's pretty much why he's viewed as the, the uncrowned champion. At 155, plus his resume, the fact that he's been working for such a long time. But I think it's New Bronx's time, man. I think oh, it's his shit, time. Josh. I think that he's worked oh, so hard for such shit. a long time. He's been an underdog in the vast majority of these fights. I he's not going to lose it. Rolling, dude. I don't think he's not going to lose it. I think the fact that he's like he's nearly a two to one underdog right now, and I think that's insane to me. I think it's a pick and uh, fight, dude. I think it's fifty fifty. I think it's I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I truly think it's a pick and fight. It's fifty fifty. I I made my pick right now. So Josh, <laughs> fuck you right head. now. How does how does he finish it? I I actually for one said what round and how it end. I'm. I think. It, I. By the way, surprisingly, you went and did that. But yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go take uh, Charles Oliveira. That's the thing, man. I think I'm gonna go ahead and take him via uh, submission. But I think what's gonna happen is I think he's gonna hurt him. I think he's gonna crack him on the feet and sub him on the ground. So it's gonna be I like think, a. Hurt, it's gonna be a hurt guy submit. So he's gonna be hurt while getting submitted. Yes, because you think of Charles Oliveira, man. Uh, you know what I think is crazy. People still say that he does not have enough heart or that. Which, by the way, the dumbest. The dumbest stereotype about a fighter has been Charles Oliveira's lack of heart. 
most of it came about um, because of that Max Holloway fight where he shot him for a takedown, he couldn't get it, and then he tore his esophagus, which, funny enough, we talked about Tiafimo, he had a complete tear of his esophagus, and he could have died. That's why a lot of people call him a quitter, because he went down in that fight. His heart should not be questioned in the Michael Chandler fight, where he got knocked down, and he fought his ass off, knocked down Michael Chandler, who is, we've seen by now, one of the best chins in the game, okay? His Tony Ferguson fight, he showed that he has a wrestling capacity. A lot of the time, with Oliveira, the big question was, he, he we know his submission skills are good, we know he's okay-ish on the feet, we know his jiu-jitsu is good, but he can't get the fight there. He's shown in his last few fights that he can fucking wrestle too, dude. Um, he's improved a lot in that. We, we see now he's a lot stronger. He's grown into his body at 155. I think it's his time, man. I truly do. I think he's going to crack Poirier on the feet. Um, I'm not sure. I'm I'm going to say how about this. I'm not going to give an exact round. Within the first 15 minutes of the fight, we're going to see Charles Oliveira and it's still. I'll put it like that. Um I think it's his time, man. That's the only way I could say within, it. Within the first three rounds, that's what you said. Within the first few, within the first three rounds, Charles Oliveira and still. Um, that I sounds think fucking just, epic, dude. You, you fucking, oh man, it's almost like you saw me on it. I mean, I'm not gonna change my pick now. I committed. I locked it in, you know. You locked it in, but I just, I think it's his time, man. I think that he's truly been slept on. I think he, I think he recognized that too, because um, most people don't view him as the champion, and for a guy like him that has worked so hard to get where he's at. Oh no, he's a champ. I will. I, yeah. I, 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 I'll agree with you. I think uh, I should clear that up because I don't know if the way I worded it, maybe people would think that. But I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna clear myself up here, Josh, to be safe. He's the champ. I mean, yeah, there's no he, doubt about that. He won that title legitimately against Michael Chandler. Yeah, and I picked against him. You know, I also did. <laughs> we both. Did. I thought it was Michael Chandler's time. So did I, but uh, I guess not, dude. Um, it's it's his fucking time. It is truly his time, and I think that he's worked so hard and. um you know, I don't know, man. It, it's it's going to be an interesting fight. It's truly 50-50 uh, to, to the highest degree for me personally. I think, like I said, I think it's insane how big of an underdog he is, at least betting-wise. I know that everybody's picking against him. And it just feels weird to me, man, because as much as I like Dustin Poirier, um, we're, we're really talking about this you know, on on the back of the fact that he beat um, Connor twice. And... The thing is that, like, a lot of the skill set that we saw from Dustin Poirier didn't really have to do with, like, grappling and also those fights. We're not really sure where Connor's at either because we haven't seen Connor win a, win a meaningful fight in years either. So um, I'm going to go and take Charles Oliveira. But as far as the rest of the card goes, dude, top to bottom, tremendous. Uh, moving on down to the co-main event, Amanda Lioness Nunes taking on Juliana Pena in a fight that has a lot more heat on it than uh, most of Nunez's fights. She was actually the one talking shit yesterday at the press conference. It's been a while since she talked shit, <clears> too. She's been really nice to her last couple of opponents. I know. I mean, she gave Felicia Spencer the belt. She she had uh, Megan Anderson meet her kid. She's back for the first time since March. And, you know, Juliana Pena, dude. She has not it. Sh- probably not. You know, um, one fight in the last – one excuse me, one win in the last two-ish years, so along those lines – um, and she had to come from behind to beat Stan McMahon, and, you know, it's it's a weird position for her to be in. But for a long time, we talked about her being a potential title challenge. It just felt like any time she got close, she lost. She should probably should have gone in after the Kyle Sigano fight, but they didn't. They had a fight with Shevchenko. She lost. We talked about it after the Montano win. Maybe she'll get the title shot. No, she fought Duran. and she lost. And she knew lost to Stan McMahon. She turned it around. She finally got the title shot. She talked a lot of shit going in about how she thinks it's her time. She thinks that Nunes is getting older. Obviously, she's you know, 33 now. She's been talking about retirement for a while. Do you truly think it's time? Do you think it's time for Juliana Pena to finally get that win, finally cement her place as one of the best band points on the planet? You know, I'll, 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 I'll give her a little credit, right? She's called her out. She's won of this fight. I mean, there's she either really believes her in herself or she sees something that we don't that she can do that, th- that she thinks will lead her to victory, which I'm not sure exactly what that is because – I don't know exactly what she's going to do that the other last five gals haven't done. You know what I mean? Or tried. And they've tried. They haven't been successful. You know, she, she, she must see something very, very, you know, clear that we, you and I can both do not see, Josh. And I'm not sure what that is. But whatever that is, I'm curious to see. Do I think she'll win? Absolutely not. I still pick. One of the greatest fighters on the planet to continue. Actually, in some people's eyes, one of the one of the goats. And some people even mm-hmm. call her the goat. 
I mean, she's the go to female mm-hmm. MMA for sure. Shit, not even. I've even heard non. I've heard no, no, no gender included, Josh. Just the go of MMA. I've heard that too. Believe it or not, for some people. Mm-hmm. You know. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the reason why she said that she's so confident about it is it, a lot of it goes into the fact that like she hasn't seen anybody try to really wrestle Nunez. And Julian Pena is a great wrestler, dude. Um, but she has her deficiencies. And by deficiencies, I mean she has a habit of getting caught in submissions whenever she kind of gets a little bit too relaxed on the ground. We saw that against Shevchenko. She was actually doing really good on the ground against Shevchenko. And she got caught in an armbar near the end of the second round. Jermaine Durand, we put her to sleep, bro. So, Man, that, and that's not a GDR game. But she could do it. She could. She actually showed – her trajectory has gotten pretty good over the years. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember there was some uh, – there were some battles with her when she fought uh, Amanda. She had a little little like success there, if I remember right. Not like anything mm. crazy, but she she did some stuff, you know. Correct, correct. She did. She knew he submitted with the triangle. I remember, uh, or it could have been an armbar. It was some along those lines. Yeah, dude. Um, but I just I don't see her being able to do it. Here's the thing, dude. I think Amanda Nunes is going to go out there and try and kill her, dude. Straight up, I, I think that she's going to go in there and just look for a finish immediately, which could be good or bad. Which yeah. can be good or bad. Good or bad. If she goes too overzealous, I think she's probably going to get, you know, honestly, probably put down and um, taken down. Rather, I I don't know, man. I, I I like Juliana Pena a lot. I really really do. I like the fact that she's bringing fire to this fight, which is rare. To see somebody do against Amanda Nunes, they actually, because even then, like you see, like fighters, like me and Anderson talked about it too, about like, oh yeah, most of her opponents are beaten by the time that they step in there and blah blah blah. And then you see Megan Anderson looking like death walking into the fight. Like, <laughs> I'll never forget, like, the like the UFC 259. I think that's the car that it was. And, like, she's walking to, like, the ring, and she looks like she saw a ghost. Like, she looks terrified. And a lot of Nunez opponents have that happen to them. Because, like, you're fighting the goat. Like, the moment gets to you, dude. And I don't think Juliana Payne is going to let that happen. I think the girl's got nerves of steel. I think she's a great wrestler. But I don't think it's going to be enough, man. Um... I think she's going to get out muscled. I think that uh, Nunez, my my bigger issue is honestly seeing if Nunez can beat the scale and see if she can beat Juliana Pena. Because <laughs> um, she has not made, she's not fought at 135 in two years, which is kind of crazy, considering the fact that there's not been a title fight there in two years. That but, could also be a factor for her too, right? Mm-hmm, entirely. But I think if if she does make it, if, if she does make the weight and she looks good, she looks fine, I'm going to go and take um, Manny Nunez via a huge finish. Um, I'm not sure what she'll do after this, but I think it'd be know. I think we'd be having a different conversation if uh, Juliana Pena was coming into this fight with you know like a like a win streak, you know she was looking like significantly good and it was like you know it was it was looking solid. I think it'd be a lot different than her having you know a win or a loss and you know you know two wins and all you know what I mean. Like I think instead, it'd be instead, had, instead the reality is is that she's coming into this off the back of a win. Um, where she had to come from behind. She was down two rounds to nothing before she beat Sarah McMahon. And Sarah McMahon, you know, God bless, but she's like in the twilight of her career too. Um, and she was supposed to, uh, Julianne Payne wasn't even supposed to get this house shot. She was supposed to fight Holly Holm. And Holly Holm had to pull out. So they're like, well, fuck, I guess we'll just give Julianne Payne the title that, shot. That would have been a good fight too. Yeah, they were just, they were just like, fuck, I guess we'll give Julianne Payne the title shot. So that's where, that's where, why she's at where she is now. Um, but yeah, dude, I don't think it's gonna go too well for her. I like her fire a lot. I, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if she won. I think that she has the style. I think the way to beat Nunez is to have a good wrestling base. Um, and have that gas to go the full 25 minutes and survive the early onslaught and so on and so forth. I just don't think Julian Pena has the capacity to do it. I don't like the fact she's been inactive either. I think you said, um, you know, if she had a good winning streak, I'd feel a lot different. But, you know, she doesn't, so. I'm going to go ahead and take Manny Nunez to retain and still on Saturday night. This card's built kind of weird, um, just like by by how it's like set up. So, we'll, we'll, I mean, regardless, we'll talk about this fight up next uh, on the main card. Jeff Neal, Santiago Ponza, and Ibio. Uh Jeff Neal lost two fights in a row, just got a DUI as well. Oh, um, shit. Is he okay? On, yeah, he's fine, but he got a DUI uh, literally two weeks ago. I wonder what the circumstance was. Like, I'm, there's no good reason to drink a drive, but you know what I mean. Like, I wonder. Yeah, he got. He was uh, driving under the influence. Excuse me. 
Driving did, under did the you see influence. how I saved it there, Josh? <laughs> he, he did. He did. <laughs> driving. I was, about, I was about to be like, dude, come on. Like, <laughs> um, driving under the influence, and then also unlawful possession of a firearm. Holy fuck, um, dude! This Something is November. Is not good. It's not a good look leading into this. It's not, it's not a good look. November twenty fifth. So literally during fight camp, not that long ago. Oh, so Thanksgiving. This is around Thanksgiving time, then, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, so there's some factors there, but still, you know. Yeah, it's definitely not good. Um. <laughs> Yeah, but regardless, you know, he's still going to be fighting. Santiago Ponzinibbio, crazy to me how old he is. He's 35. He's coming off a nice winner with Miguel Baeza, one of the fight, fights of the year, I think, still, yeah, even if, um, you know, maybe he's been surpassed for a long time. That was my kind of standard fight of the year up until, like, November, where we just had banger after banger since then. Um, prior to that, he lost to the, uh, via knockout to the leech and his long way to return. He's had so many medical issues. I really hope he can get back on track, man. I really hope so. For a long time, it looked like he could be like a pencil tribal challenge. I really thought after he beat Neil Magny, I was like, we're looking at a future champion. Then he's had all the injuries and the loss and so on and so forth. Who do you think, you, uh, who do you got in this one? Is it two guys that kind of need a win to get back into title contention? I, I'm taking Santiago Ponce on Nibio, man. I didn't know these are all outside of factors leading into it. And even regardless, even if I didn't know that, I would have still picked Santiago Ponce on Nibio. I mean, for me, before he left, man, what was he, top five guy? Could have almost found himself in a title position. He got caught by the leech, which, you know, he's a heavy-handed dude. And uh, to top that off, man, I mean, he, he, has a, he has a good, well-rounded skill set. He's a tough dude. He comes out to bang. He fucking put it against a young stud who honestly... Really, like if he won, if, if Miguel Baez had won that fight, I mean, it was looking like it was going to be Miguel, Miguel Baez this time. I mean, you and I talked about him as a big prospect. What was it like? Maybe two fight, two fights into his career, maybe like into his mm. career. Like we were, we we had high hopes for him. Yeah, correct. Yeah, man. I mean, he looks like he could be the next guy. And honestly, I truly do not feel like he Santiago Ponzinibbio was back until that Baez fight. Whenever he was getting his ass kicked in the first round, I'm not sure if you remember this, dude. He had to survive a huge storm, and in the rounds two and three, dude, he just, like, he he lost all the rust, and he came back, and he got the win against this young line, and I, I was, like, from that moment forward, I'm like, you know what? Pond's back. He's he's back, dude. Pond's going to be his back, um, and I'm going to take him in this one, too, dude. Uh, even if he did not have the outside factors going on, I'd still probably pick Pond's going to be, but now the fact that he literally just got a DUI two, two weeks ago, and the fact that he's got all this stuff going on... um. You know, it's uh, it's not a good look, man. I like Jeff Neal a lot, man. I I think the fact that they've kind of managed his career this way is a l- little bit disappointing, right? I thought after he lost to Wonderboy Thompson, it was pretty clear he needed to take a step back in competition. He got dominated in that one. Um, and instead, the match went up with Neil Magny, dude, and that was just another bad matchup, and he lost that one. I think he's going to lose this one, too. Um, which is a damn shame, because I remember thinking after he beat Mike Perry that he was fucking, you know, like, <laughs> he was going to be golden, dude. Uh, but I guess not, so, you know, I'm going to take Pons here, we'll see what happens, though. And then this one, huge fight, dude, very, very big fight, Cody Garbrandt, who, you know, has talked a long time about moving down to flyweight, even after he beat Dom Cruz, he mentioned it, because he was one of the lighter bantamweights, I know, like, he, he only cut, like, maybe five or six pounds to make bantamweight, and now he's fighting at flyweight, obviously, we're going to see if he makes the weight later today, um, but, um, He's going to be squaring off against Kai Carr France, one of the top flyweights on the planet, ranked number six, coming off a win over Hojiyo Boltan in March, UC 259. Dude, Garbrandt needs this one. Garbrandt needs, I mean, he's, he's lost four of his last five. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird factors in that. I mean, the fact that the Dillashaw fight, he was champion. Um, he had, he lost an incredible comeback from D- Dillashaw. And obviously, losing to TJ is no big deal. He did it again afterwards. The Munoz fight was fight of the night. He knocked out a Sun Sal. And the Rob Font fight was just a weird one where he had a terrible, terrible fight with COVID before that. Maybe he rushed back too soon. And now he's moving down a flyway, dude. It, this feels like a desperation move out of Cody Garbrandt. So, um, regardless, though, I will ask, who do you got on this one? There was two fights that, leading up to this card, I did not have any idea who to pick. And even this morning, I was still deciding and I had to prepare for it. This is one of them, Josh. Mm-hmm. Because Kaikara kind of had a little stint there, you know, a little two fight skit. It happens, right? Because as far as the city kickboxing guys, he looked like he was the next guy for them, right? He was going to find himself in a title position. They were going to get him in the, in that spot to, to become champ, right? Obviously, I, I, I think he can find, I don't know if he's, I'm not going to say he's in champ material, but I don't know if he's going to, I don't know how he'll be when he gets to that position. 
You know what I mean? If he gets to it, right? And I mean, he's mm-hmm. not far from it. If I'm if I'm being honest, he really isn't. You know, because I think the the guys he lost to, there's a, dude, he he's capable of winning those matchups. Uh, you know, and it, it's no disrespect to who who was it? Let me look. Let me look at it real, real quick. A guy like Brandon Rivera, I mean, he caught him in a guillotine. Like shit happens, right? Brandon Moreno, who's now our champ, right? Like uh, these are all like it, those aren't. And Brandon Moreno beat Brandon Rival to find himself in that title position yeah. in December, right? Like it's. There's some stuff there, right? And I think, and, and even sadly for Brandon Ravel, he's coming off what two losses now. Like you know, it it it's just it's just how fighting is, man. Like you know, and MMA math doesn't always add up, right? So that's a, that's a big factor. And Kai Car has been around for a while, man. I mean, people forget he was on the Ultimate Fighter. You know, he was on that season with Brandon Pantoja. Like he comes from that. You know what I mean? Which is mm-hmm. crazy. And you know, he didn't make it to the UFC after that. You know, he had to be outside of the UFC for like two years and then he found himself in the UFC when he finally got his chance against uh, Elias Garcia and you know the rest is history and uh been pretty successful since then for mm-hmm. me my whole thing is when we talked about this and we're doing this before the weigh-ins I was like I don't know how Cody's gonna come in looking to these weigh-ins he could come in looking like death last guy who did this coming up from a weight who was a weight class above coming down didn't look fucking good fucking damn near fucking like death was literally stepping on death's door for me, it's all dependent on how Cody's going to come in, how he's going to look, how he's going to feel. I'm just going to personally take the safe pick. I'm going to pick Kai Kara France. Mm. Yeah, that's fair enough, man. I think this fight, like you said, it's truly a pick 'em. I think there's, a, there's honestly a fight card of pick 'ems, like a lot of them. Um, I, I, like, I honestly, to me personally, the only one that's not kind of like a very close fight to pick on the main card is the Nunes fight. Oh, I mean, um, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how it is at this point. That's how it's it's been for a while. But yeah, this one very much um, like the main event. It's probably my second hardest fight to pick. Maybe even number one. Cody really? Garbrandt during his entire entire losing streak, I never felt like Cody Garbrandt was like bad or anything. Um, I just felt like he was making like mental mistakes that like. Maybe the Rob Font one was the first time we really saw him get out class, but even then I was like, if he had a little bit more activity, that one was even winnable, because Rob Font just won that by standing back and jabbing him. It wasn't like a super entertaining fight, it was just kind of a weird one, dude. It was a weird um, fight looking back at it, because I, don't, I, don't, I remember I finished that fight, and I was like, whoa, that just happened. Yeah, it was it was one of those weird fights. You know, like a lot of guys, as they get older, they just don't pull the trigger. Cody Garbrandt did not pull the trigger at all. Woodley? Yeah, I was kidding. Wood, yeah, Woodley, for sure, which we'll talk about next week, God forbid, you know. Um, but anyways, like, we see that a lot of guys get older, right? They they kind of can't pull the trigger. Um, Cody Garbrandt is not old. I, I'm not sure how old he is. I, I probably just check it out right now. He's he's 30 years old. He just turned 30, which, by the way, it makes him so fucking young when he won the title. Good Lord, I forgot how young he was. Um, but yeah, dude, he's still, he's still only 30. But yet he kind of had that weird thing where like, he couldn't pull the trigger against Rob Vaughn. But outside of that fight, I would never really thought, like, Cody was bad or anything. Like, he knocked out a Sun Tzu. The Sun Tzu has been, I mean, I've always said he's the most underrated guy at Bantamweight for, like, 10 years now. Um, the fact that he never got a title shot is stupid to me. Ridiculous. Um, yeah, dude, even the Dillashaw fights, I'm like, if he's more measured in his approach, he probably wins them, especially the first one. Um, the, the Munoz fight, same thing. Like, he, he hurt him, and he went in for the kill, and he got caught. So it's just these little mental mistakes, dude, that are holding him back, and I don't think him moving down to weight is going to solve anything. So until he figures out the mental game, uh, until he f- figures it out and proves that he can stay consistent with that mental game, I'm going to go and pick against him. Take Kai Car France. I think he's just going to outpoint him. Um, if he tries to go for that one hitter quitter like he did against Rob Font, and he can't find the opening, especially in the three rounder, dude. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take Kai Car France. Just There's a lot of factors, him. dude. There's a lot of factors. How is he going to look on the scale? The weight cut, the chin, at a weight cut. You know, your chin is the same when you cut weight. It's not. And the fact that he... I just don't like this move, dude. I've always thought, like, if you want to move down, that's okay. However, if you're going to move down, first of all, like, you've got to fix other stuff around it than just pretending that moving down is going to solve all your problems. Or moving up in weight. Like, whatever Luke Rockhold moved up, you know what I mean? Like, there's... you got to do other stuff than just move like with the weight's not the fucking problem. Like God I'm damn, not sure. Luke Rockle looked good at like heavyweight though. He did. He was first team all body, you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> Yes. But dude, these guys gotta realize that just moving up and down in weight, like, it doesn't fucking do anything. Not, not for everybody. Not for everybody. Like it worked for Michael Chiesa, it worked for uh but Sean you, Brady. But, but it doesn't work saying, for everybody. 
they also improve their skill set as well. Also, it's entirely they, possible. The yes, those guys they get better. Yeah, those guys. They it's entirely better. possible they're going to improve their skill set as well. But here's the thing, dude. Like from what I've seen, Garbrandt's treating it like he's still the same guy, just moving down ten pounds. And by the way, he looks shredded out of his mind. I'm not sure if he's going to find that weight to cut. So. Um, I just don't like the move at all, dude. If he was going to do it whenever he was, like, winning at bantamweight, I'd feel a lot different. Is he be the but, biggest bantamweight, by the way? Or biggest flyweight, I mean? Like uh, probably not. Weight? Probably figured out. How tall is No, I'm talking about height-wise. Not, not oh, height-wise? Yeah. Oh, shit, I don't know. Uh, he's Tyson Nam's like pretty damn tall. Oh, yeah, I forget about Tyson Nam. Um, Tyson Nam, he's, he's, he splits it at 125 and 135, so I'm not really sure. Well, the reason I brought that up is because I saw Cody, and he's, like, 5'8". I was like, dude. Damn. Oh, he's damn. He's that, he's that tall? That's what it says according to Tapology. Huh. I didn't realize he was that tall. Like, like, I call France is 5'4", so I didn't even... They, didn't, they did not look four, that... I see 5'5 five five on Tapology. <laughs> or five yeah, I'm not looking on Wiki, man. <laughs> I saw 5'5 five five somewhere else. I could be wrong. But still, though, I fucking saw that, and I was like, dude, that's fucking massive. You know, like, Cody's... Yeah. 5'8", like and they could be, like, 5'8 and a few inches, you know what I mean? Mm. I mean, who yeah, has good reach and all that, but like, the thing is, you know, like, out of all those guys, like, is he going to be the biggest guy height wise? Like, he's going to be a giant amongst amongst men, dude. Dude, he just he needs to figure out his, his technical ability and the mental stuff. If he figures that out, I have no problem, dude. I have literally, literally no problem. Um, actually, scratch that. Brandon Rubel is five nine, so. Oh, well, maybe close to go. five. Maybe close to five eight. I just wanted to bring that up. Oh, okay. Yeah, but dude, if he figures it out, and I would love to see Cody figure it out because I, I'm I love Cody Garbrandt straight up, dude. Like I remember whenever he beat Cruz, I was like, this kid, he's a future, dude. That was a fucking performance too, dude. Like it's crazy to think that was was that his last good performance. I mean, even a Sunsau, nothing happened until he knocked him out. So yeah, I'd say so. That's what I'm saying. You know? Yeah. No, hey, it was just the truth. And you remember whenever he brought the the kid in? Um, the kid with, like, cancer? He had, yeah, as I said, did he have cancer? I don't want to be incorrect. He did. He, no, he did. I, I believe he did. Um, and, he, and he put the bell around him? Yeah, dude. You know, I was like, this kid is the fucking future, dude. This kid is going to be a huge star. And he kind of was for a while there, dude. I mean, he was he did that on the undercard of a Rousey fight. So, um, you know, the Dillashaw fights were pretty big. But since then, dude, it's just kind of weird how like, how big and how fast he's fallen off, man. He, he was 10-0, and 0 too. Like, he was undefeated. It was a perfect storm for him, right? From 10-0 and 0 to 12-4. and 4. I mean, it's still oh, not so a bad. From eleven and zero to twelve and four, Jesus. I mean, it's not it's, it's not a bad record still. Like I'm not gonna lie, to you. like. It is, but granted, when you look into it though, yeah, like how it's been lately, that's when it starts looking bad. Hey, you Bravo West, look into it, dude. But yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it's rough, man. Oh, it's rough. That, <laughs> <laughs> it's rough, man. I want to see Cody pick up the win, but I'm gonna go and pick Kyle Car- Car- I think he's just a safe pick, considering all the unknown factors on Cody's side, um, heading into this one. Uh, but opening up the card. A very underrated good fight. Um, I know that a lot of people, whenever Sean O'Malley's most recent fight got announced, they were like, who? But he's taking on Julian Pavia. And Julian Pavia is a motherfucker, man. Um, and obviously, Sean O'Malley, huge hyped up prospect. 14 and 1. If you ask him, he's 14 and 0. Um, that, that Marlon Vera loss did not count, which I think is really, really funny that he's treating it like he's undefeated still. Um, but yeah, dude. He a uh, huge star, not really huge star, but he has the the, the possibility to be a huge star. Um, he hangs out with a lot of these YouTubers. He streams on Twitch. He's friends with Sickness Nine for some reason. Um, he talks to the Melt Boys. He does all that. Friends shit. with you know Steve will do it. You know he's friends with everybody. Um, and uh, you know he has the capacity to be a huge star if he can just get into the title picture. If he can just get into the top contention, and. He's not fighting a ranked guy. He's fighting a formerly ranked guy who should be a ranked guy. I'm not sure why he's not, but he's fighting on Julian Pavia. Former ranked guy at Fly. He moved up to Bantamweight early this year, and he got a huge win. B. Kyler Phillips, who is a huge prospect and um, you know a former ranked guy in one of my favorite fights of the year. It's not fight of the year contention, but just the whole story of him coming back. And I've always been a Pavia fan since like the Contender Series days. Not really Contender Series, but more like his early entry to the UFC days. Um, so seeing him get this huge shot, I'd love to see it, man. He's a huge underdog here. Who do you got on this one, man? I think it's a lot closer match with what people are kind of are kind of uh, saying. Oh yeah, the odds are shit on this, dude. The odds are fucking terrible. This is another pick and fight. This is when I said there was two fights on this card that I had really a hard time like deciding who was going to pick. This was the other one. Fair enough, man. Believe so, it or not. No, I believe it, dude. Because I'm, I'm on the same wavelength. I think a lot of people have just 
Because Rule and Poppy, I'm pretty sure he's only exclusively fought of Fight Nights during this whole COVID period. A lot of people legitimately don't know who he is and how good he is. Well, they get so, to know him now. They're going to get to know him now. Uh, do you think he picks the win on Saturday? Do you think he pulls up the upset? You know, this is the whole thing. You know, I, I fucking, I, this is, I went back and forth on this minute. And I'm going to go Sean O'Malley, Josh. I'm going to fucking, I think this is actually kind of a surprise to you. Because I think, mm. I, to an extent, I think it's kind of a surprise to you. But I'm going to go Sean O'Malley. I think he'll be able to be very fast, very in and out, very elusive, good with his leg kicks. But I got to give credit. Fabia has some of the good same shit. Like he has good movement. He can move to the, he has great lateral movement, solid kicks. He's a well-rounded dude. It's going to be an interesting matchup. I just think Sean O'Malley will be able to sneak it out somehow. I think he'll fucking surprise us. He's done it time and time again. I think, and it's going to sound weird, Josh. I feel like a lot me if you follow the sport closely. I feel like a lot of people would actually pick Pavia over O'Malley. Mm. And I don't think that's an unrealistic thing to say. No, I don't think it's unrealistic to say at all. I think it's a perfectly fine thing to say. I think this fight, um, obviously, the Marlon Vera fight, he lost. That was supposed to be his biggest test. But he lost in a way that, like, it didn't hurt his stock almost at all because he got yeah. injured. And it was a freak injury, too. It was like Gosh, his, he's 15-0, dude. Undefeated. He's 15 and 0. Yeah, undefeated. Um, it was like <laughs> a perennial nerve that got hit. And that's something that's such a freak injury. And it went down. And it, it happens, dude, right? Yeah. This fight to me is his second. This is his re-entering. Is his biggest test. You know what I mean? Um, kind of like not really re-enter, but you, you kind of get what I'm saying. Like, this is his his new biggest test. And Rulon Pavia, great guy, phenomenal guy, much better than what people are anticipating. He was talking that shit at the press conference yesterday. You could tell that he feels like it's his moment. He's such a young guy. I need to watch um, that by the way because I saw the clip of him and. Uh... Sorry, to cut you off there. But I need to go rewatch yeah. that because I saw him and he's like Dana. Let me and Cody face off right now. <laughs> Yeah, he, it was it was funny, dude. It was, more, it was a lot more entertaining than I thought it was going to be. Um, both these guys are very young, too, by the way. Uh, he's Rulon Pavia is only 26. He's younger than O'Malley. Um, but, dude, he's That's been through a lot of shit. I saw, like, um, like his path to get here in 2018, his girlfriend was murdered. What? Um, he, yeah, he's gone through a lot of shit, man, to get to, shit, dude. to get to where he is. Um, what a guy. And, you know, he, he dropped out of college to pursue MMA. He has a really interesting backstory, and I feel like you can tell that was, well. If the UCs was good at promoting fighters, they'd be talking about him, but obviously they're throwing all their stock behind O'Malley. And really and Pavia can't pull up the offset this weekend. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um I would love to pick him, dude. And I told probably, him, do I you think, think they'll bury him if he loses this? Like they'll really like slow him down. Who, O'Malley? No, Pavia. Oh yeah, for sure. That sucks, man, because he he's he legitimately has like if you go look at his losses, like I don't his obviously had an early loss in professional career. He had a split decision loss to Kai Kara, and after that he had a loss because of a cut. Yeah, so yeah. he's he's phenomenal, dude. He's very very good, um, and that showed in the Kyler Phillips fight. I know a lot of people were like, it should have been a draw, because you know he went ahead and you know the first round was really dominant. And I'm like, dude, that first round was dominant, but so was round three, and either one was scored ten eight. So it was, it was just a back and forth war. I don't understand why people get like upset about that sort of shit. Um, if it's like a super close fight like that, and it's such a it's back and forth war, dude. So. Um, and Kyler Phillips, dude, he's the guy that looked like he was the future, dude. Like, and he still could be, um, because he's still, you know, 26 years old, and he had beat Song Yudong before that, and Song Yudong looks like a killer, and he had to play MMA math, but dude, Milan probably had beat that kid, so he beat Kyler Phillips, and he, he was a phenomenal guy in his own right, so he's very much underrated, but I think just the styles, I think this is a huge style clash, dude. Um, Milan Pavi, I like the kid a lot, but he gets hit, he's very, very hittable. Um, at least based off his last performance and a couple of other ones where he's kind of had to outlast guys and he kind of showed his punching power. He's kind of, he has a lot of confidence in his own hands, which is fine. You know, that's fine. Um, but I think just like the style matchup, Sugar is a killer, especially when it comes to precision. Um, he's very accurate with his punches, very, very accurate, very smooth. And I think this is a fight where like, I don't think he's going to put out Pavia. Cause I think Rulon Pavia, I think he showed in his last fight, chin of steel, absolute chin of steel. Um, but I think he's probably going to take the first round, maybe the first two rounds. I think he's probably going to come back late in third, but I don't think it's going to be enough, man. That's a, that's just how I have my mental image of this fight going. I don't think he's going to put him out, but um, I think it's going to be a close fight. I'm going to take Sean O'Malley in the first real test of his career. You know what I mean? Where he's going to have to walk through fire. He's going to have to get hurt, and I think I'm going to take Sean O'Malley in a very close fight. But once again, real on Pavia, tough kid. Sugar's on a very real chance of losing this weekend. Um, at least, does. at least. From from what I view, I'm not sure how the uh, what are the betting odds this fight. I know you mentioned how they're very lopsided. I I'm I've sure they're lopsided. I think they are. I haven't wrong. seen the.
whenever the betting line first came out, I think Sugar was a three to one favorite. I'm but let me go ahead and look it up now as we're talking about it. I, um, at least I don't think that makes sense because I think it should be fifty fifty. I think it should be probably Sugar, very very slight favorite. Really? Um, I don't know, dude. I think oh, okay. He's he's actually even a bigger favorite than I thought. He's a minus three fifteen, so he's he's high, He's a bit higher than a three to one favorite. Let's see, like, I don't know. I, I think it should be close. Yeah, so I think that's that's mind blowing that he's, yeah, he's the 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 smallest odd that I could see. Uh, well, not smallest odd, but like you know the the, the lights that he's a favorite in is a minus three hundred. He's as high as a minus three fifty five. That is insane to me. Um. But yeah, dude, if you guys are looking for a nice bet this weekend, we'll be on Pavia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Damn, dude, you can get some nice cash on that one. Because like I said, real 50-50 in my mind. I feel like people only pick him because they don't know who the kid is, which isn't really fair in my yep. opinion. That's how it is. Um, That's how it is as far as the rest of the card goes, though, this is a stacked one, even down to the prelims. So what, is the, what are the couple of fights you're kind of looking forward to most talking about? I mean, let's just keep rolling down, Josh. I mean, do we even have to, like, follow an order at this point? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, dude. We'll, go, we'll move right down. Josh Emmett, Dan Ige. Finally, dude. Huge, huge fight. Not really for, not really for Dan. I feel like Dan's kind of, we've learned his position in the division, at least by virtue of his, his fight to Cater and his loss to Cater. I mean, uh, his loss to Korean Zombie. Stuff like that. I also thought he lost to Barboza. But he solidified himself as a, as a borderline top 10 guy. Very, very good. Um, I think he lacks a bit of size. I think he lacks a little bit of punching power at the division. But still very competent, very well rounded. Taking on Josh Emmett, who before he got injured, he got injured in his Shane Burgos fight. Before that, we were talking about him as title contention, bro. He knocked out Michael Johnson. He knocked out Mursad Bektik. And that Burgos fight was one of my fights of the year in 2020. So this fight is just tremendous. What do you think about that one? Fucking banger, dude. Josh Emmett's back. Obviously dealt with him. He was using him with a – was it a back injury? A uh, injury? torn ACL, I believe. Ooh. And yeah, he was dealing with some sort of injury. Damn, I was like on the completely wrong side of the body. <laughs> <That's okay, laughs> Yeah, but he's back. I want to see him fight, dude. Remember, I kept saying, I want to see Josh Emmett fight. I want to see Josh Emmett fight. Finally, Josh Emmett is fighting, so. Hope mm-hmm. he produces. Same with Danny Ige. Yep, same. It's, it's, it is uh, an absolute tremendous fight. But, dude, I'm honestly more excited for the fight below it. We um, talked about Dom, it, though. That's why. Yeah. Dom Cruz, Pedro Munoz. I'm a huge Dom Cruz fan. I think he's the bantamweight goat. But he's 36 now. He, he's been, you know, surprisingly... Surprisingly active um, since COVID began. He fought in 2020 against Cejudo. This is his second fight of the year. Um, so three fights in two years is honestly pretty, um, you know. After being gone for a while, yeah, dude. Like, there was a long, long layoff from his career. It was very sad, man. Mm, so it's pretty good, dude. He picked up a nice win over Casey Kenny. That was a split decision. I thought it was actually like a pretty clear 30-27 for Tom Cruise. Um, but regardless... Um, that was a split decision win, and Pedro Munoz is obviously coming off of three losses in his last four fights, which feels weird to say because I felt like after that Garbrandt win, he had so much momentum. Then he got dominated by Aljo. He lost to Frankie Edgar in a war where I honestly thought he won. He beat Jimmy Rivera, and then he got the, he had the loss to uh, Aldo. This is a very close fight, man. Very, very close fight. Um, intrigued to see what happens here if Cruz wins because, like you mentioned, if Cruz wins, you know, maybe you can, you can throw him into a ton of attention about, dude, at that point. Um so, yeah, we'll see what happens there. Jordan Wright is back. That's going to be a fun fight against Bruno Silva. But the one I skipped over, I didn't mean to. Tai Tuivasa, Augusta Sakai, dude. Tai Tuivasa had a really funny thing at, like, um, Banger. At, at media day. They asked him, Tai, so whenever you're, like, not doing fighting, how often do you do shoeies? And then his response was, um, something along the lines, honestly paraphrasing. He said, how often does a priest go to church? <laughs> So, Tai Tui a cool guy of the week, for sure. He's back, dude. <laughs> After having that three-fight skid in 2018 and 2019, dude, three fights to make up for it. Competition, you know, at a level, right? But mm-hmm. he got it. he's getting his jump in competition, which I think, this is the right guy, right? I guess Sakai isn't a bad matchup. I think this, this is going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. For sure. Very much moving in the right direction. If he wins this one, you know, he's getting himself in that position where he's potentially title contention bound once again. <clears throat> I'll say that if I win. Andre Muniz, Eric Anders. This breaks my heart, though, because it wasn't supposed to be Eric Anders. No, it was not. I, who was he supposed to fight? He's supposed to fight Drikish Duplicius, dude. Ooh. Oh, but kind of butchered the second last name. Or the, yeah. The I, but, dude, you're talking about? that would have been a fucking banger, dude. He beat. He fought my boy Robert mm-hmm. Solodich in fucking KSW, beat him the first time, lost the second time. 
fought a few times after that, and then got pulled into UFC. Fucking beat Trevin Giles. Fucking put him out, Josh. That was a nice knockout during the year. That was. He was going to fight Andre Muniz, which these guys, I think it would have been, I am not say I didn't want to see it this early, but I would have been perfectly fine with it because it would have been a fucking banger. Mm-hmm. For sure, and honestly, I don't like this matchup for Eric Anders, dude, because Andre Muniz, one of the best prospects, arguably in the UFC, for I me mean, for my money. I mean, the dude submitted Jacare. I don't care how old Jacare was, he he broke his arm, bro. Like he is tremendous on the. Hey, Jacare did tap though. He did. He did. Eric Anders is coming off a nice win over Darren Stewart, but I know he's moving back down to middleweight, right, for this one. Um, so yeah, he's he's been a weird guy. He's been up and down in terms of weight. Um, but you know, we'll see what happens, man. I don't think it's going to be a fun, fun night for him, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a fun fight probably. Uh, fight, there's two fights I'm most looking forward to on the prelims, not on the early prelims, I guess I, I should specify. Miranda Maverick, Aaron Blanchfield, and a battle of former Invicta fighters, but more than just that, it's like these are two of the brightest prospects in a division that needs them badly, dude. Um, obviously Flyweight's just in a really, really bad place. Um, and obviously, I mean, you have Man of Ravik, who's coming off like a robbery loss to Macy Barber, and that was just a terrible decision, probably the worst decision of the year. Uh, part of that, she had two nice wins. Aaron Blanfield's coming off one of the most lopsided wins in UFC history uh, in September against Sarah Alpar. I, let me just go and find the quick scorecards. Jesus Christ, I, I God, it was so much worse than I imagined. 30 25s across the board. Uh, so Aaron Blanchfield, very good fighter. And Angel, the other fight I want to go and highlight on the early prelims. I know you're excited for this one. Ryan Hall's return. Um, soon. I didn't think it this quick. Yeah, against Derek Minner. Ryan Hall got knocked out in his last fight. But I don't think there's any shame losing to uh, uh, Leah Tapura. And he also broke his hand in that one. First punch. Shit happens. You know, shit happens. And part of that, he had the best out-of-context winning streak of all time, feeding Artem Lobov, Gray Maynard, BJ Penn, Darren Elkins. Um, <laughs> all those guys, which were old as hell when that fight happened, except for Artem. Dude, it's crazy that this card could have been even better than what it is right now. At one point, they could have potentially had Brandon Moreno versus Pantoja. Pantoja wasn't available. Who knows what the circumstance was right there. Brandon, and then he got, and then they rescheduled the Brandon versus Davidson. About had to be rescheduled. Remember the context there? Mm-hmm. And Leon Edwards... Versus Jorge Masvidal was on this card at one point, which also mm-hmm. devastating loss to us. And actually, funny enough, Macy Barber was supposed to fight Aaron Blanchfield originally. This fight on this fucking card, so some poetic justice there for a uh, random average, like that you mentioned earlier. Exactly, it's 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 it's, it's justice, honestly. Um, but dude, that fight against Derek Minner, dude, I didn't realize how good Derek Minner was on the mat. It was pretty good, but like, dude, twenty two submission wins. <laughs> 22 submission wins out of 26 wins in his career. The thing is, does it go to the ground instantly? No, 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 it doesn't. Um, and but dude, I'm very excited to see Ryan Hall back. I still think he can be a top 15 guy. I really think he can be. It, it, the that, only sad thing is age. He's 36, Josh. He is 36. He'll be 37 um, next year. So his time's running out, but I think that's why he. I think he knows that, which is why he took this fight immediately. People don't. People don't want to fight him too. That's the other issue, dude. People. And he was down, dude. He was down to fight Josh Emmett back in twenty nine, like was it twenty nineteen? Like he was, he was game. And also, he was down to fight Ricardo Lamas. Remember, Lamas was really good too. So you got to give respect to the guy. It's not like he wasn't willing to fight the top dogs. Exactly. He's been wanting fights for a long time. So I respect the fact that he's coming back in here almost immediately, taking another guy, Derek Miller, who's an unranked beast. So um, we'll see what happens, man. Overall, just a tremendous card. Is there anything else I left out that you want to go and talk about? No, dude, I mean, we pretty much highlight everybody. I mean, obviously, I think we should obviously highlight former uh, title challenger Alex Perez versus Mike Schnell, too, who we forgot to mention in there, too. Of course, of course. That's actually a, that's a very fun fight as well. And since we're highlighting people, I forgot one more fight I want to go and highlight. It's not really a fight, but more of a fighter. Uh, Priscilla Casuera. Weird fight to highlight, but, dude, she has such a, an interesting career. Not really career, but, like, her career trajectory, I guess I should say. Uh, she fought Shevchenko whenever she was 8-0 and had the most lopsided fight numbers-wise in UFC history. Um, she lost, she got, uh, outstruck 230 to 3. And, um, that's the fight that got Yamasaki banned from the UFC. Um, she then got injured and she lost two straight fights to Molly McCann and Luana Carolina. 
She seems to rebound it with two straight knockout wins against Shayna Dobson and Gina Mazzani. And now she's in a position where like, she wins this fight against Ju- uh, Julian Robertson, which is completely winnable. Dude, she's, she might break the top 15. She really might. Like, that's, that's good awesome. For good for her. Good for her. Yeah. So she that's, that's it. a, cr- it's a crazy ass story, dude. So good for her. Um, but yeah, dude, I think that's pretty much all there's left to really talk about this card. Overall, tremendous one, dude. We went deep on that, man. I love that. Of course, and dude, it just, it's oh, such shit, a cage war is about to start. I'm sorry to say that. Sorry, could you watch? <laughs> no, you're, you're fine, bro. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an absolutely insane card. But the only last thing we really have to talk about, uh, and it's kind of, just, you know, it's not, we're going to talk about the fight, but we're kind of talking about what it really leads into as well. Both of those sit 72, their main event, Sergio Pettis getting one of the knockouts uh, of a lifetime, honestly. Um, spinning back fist knockout over Koji Horiguchi. Um, insane. Uh, the, Horiguchi was dominating the fight up until that point. Round four, a minute left. He gets put to sleep with a spinning back fist. He fainted the leg kick, and he gets the knockout with the back kick, which, by the way, I love that. I love that. Like, he fainted the leg, the head, uh, excuse me, not leg kick, the head kick, and he threw the spinning back fist. He got the knockout. Didn't fall up with any ground and pound. I love to see it, dude. Absolutely awesome. And that leads into what Bellator announced on the night of. They're going to do a Bantamweight Grand Prix tournament. And Bellator, they have these tournaments. Sometimes they're hit or miss. This one's dude, a hit. This one's a hit all the way. Um, they have Sergio Pettis, Koji Horiguchi, Juan Archuleta, um, Magomed Magomedov, James Gallagher, Rufon Stotts, and Leandro Higo. Holy shit. Yeah, dude, Bellator just dropped their fat cock on everybody in MMA right there. <laughs> Like, I'm not even trying to, like, be funny. Like, it's, I'm being, like, completely serious. Yeah, dude, it is it is an insane Grand Prix. I mean, there are early impressions. Who do you think is the favorite in this one? You had to say the champ, right? Yeah, probably. I mean, I'm actually – there's there's two guys. Actually, I mean, no, I, 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 I'll actually – fuck, I sorry to cut you off there. I think uh, – can, can I give you my tears going down? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, so I'll – Actually, fuck that. I'm going to go Kyoji Horiguchi, Sergio Pettis, and then Rufion Stotts, top three, that order. And that's actually, okay. In the actually, I, put, I might even put Rufion Stotts above Sergio. Mm. Yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say Rufion Stotts all the way, dude. Straight up. Just, just. Really? Just stop Rufion Stotts, dude. I mean, if I were to go and rank him from least likely to most likely, I'd probably put. You know, Leandro Higo last. No offense to the guy, but I mean, I've never been that high on Leandro Higo. Probably James um, especially... Gallagher after that, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go Higo Gallagher, probably Archuleta. Archuleta? Yeah, Agamedov. Which even then, he's still a tough power, depending on how his bracket breaks out. Oh yeah, entirely. Pettis, Horiguchi, and then Rufon Stotts. I'm so impressed with that kid, dude. I, I, I'm. I mean, especially after that Mago and Magomedov win. I love that kid, dude. I mean, just his career, how he's improving so much fight to fight. We'll have to see how the matchups work out, but I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna take him, dude. Honestly. I think, I think a big thing that will play is matchups too, dude. Because someone could get, and it's no disrespect to anybody. I mean, someone could get a site where they start with James Gallagher, and then their falling opponent is like, and it's not like they'd be a tough. It's not like it wouldn't be an easy fight, but like Archuleta or Higo, you know what I mean? Yeah, entirely. I think there's it, it's all all about the matchups, dude. That's that's all it comes down to, honestly. Because someone Cause, someone could have a side where it's literally Sergio Pez, Koji Hiroyuchi, Rufion Stotts, Juan Arch, You know what I mean? There could be, you know that could be your matchups that you could potentially get. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it also just comes down to like the fact that like, for example, a guy like James Gallagher, who I mean that's what, that's what makes this whole thing interesting, right? Like James Gallagher, who's you know. Submission skills are amazing, but he kind of lacks like the wrestling ability and the striking. Maybe he gets matched up with Pettis, whose who's, you know worst attributes are his wrestling. You know what I mean? So it could, it's all about matchups, dude. That's what makes predicting this sort of thing so difficult. I think once the matchups come out and we see who's going to be fighting who, we'll have a lot better like idea. But my early impression, like who's the most well-rounded to beat anybody, it's Rufon Stott. That's who I'm picking. But regardless, dude, as far as Pettis goes... Good lord, dude. Just absolutely incredible win. I mean, Pettis, he's finally arrived. And I know people are calling that win a fluke win. It Come wasn't. on, man. It wasn't. I mean, he even, it's not even a situation like, um, I, I hate to say fluke in MMA. Like, I really, I, I disagree that any fight is a fluke. 
I mean, it it was. I wouldn't say. Okay, I'll put it like this. It was a very. What's the word for it? It was a. It was one of those efforts where he, he's like, I need to throw something, and he threw something, and it landed. You know, he's like, I need to get wild, and he throws something out there. You know what I mean? And it worked. And plus, that Horiguchi had gone to that kind of position where he goes to his side to take him down. When he backed off, at some point he had realized there was enough space there to land a spinning back fist. Hmm. Well, you know what helps too is the fact that also he was able. People say stuff is fluke, but like he set that up. Like he did, he got on the clinch. He threw the head kick as a kind of like a feint, and then he was able to go ahead and land the spinning back fist. I think if you call that shit a fluke, like you can, like it's a comeback for sure. But it's not a, it's not a fluke. It was sick, dude. And plus, like Horiguchi is still Horiguchi, and he like what, what, what? Actually, it was a tweet that I saw from Man Hill Cape. He was like, "That was cool. That was an SKO. That was sick. But Horiguchi's better." Oh, you know? yeah, for sure. I mean, top yeah. I, I pick Horiguchi in rematch. That's, that's, that's I mean, what I'm saying, you know? Mm. But, yeah, man, we're we're going to go ahead and see what happens with that one. Regardless, it's a phenomenal tournament. Bellator is just, dude, they have a huge year lined up. I know that they went ahead and... Um, dude, we have the finals next year for the tournament, dude. We still haven't even gotten that yet. We still I know, they're only... The thing is, dude, is they're only getting better. Like, they're only... They're only, I mean, just, here's some of the fights that they already have, like, announced, right? They have that belt, the, the Bantamweight World Grand Prix, um, officially announced. Fyodor's final fight in Mount, Moscow is getting finalized, according to Scott Coker, right? Uh, Vadim Nemkov, Corey Anderson, Gegard Mousasi, Austin Vandeford, and Ryan Vander. Bader, Valentin Moldovsky have all been confirmed for next year. And we know MVP is in a fight next year at some point. We know Apparently, they're fight. looking for him to get the title shot, too. Yeah, and then- yeah, I was saying, and then we got fucking Amazon who has to defend. Like, it's, it's fucking legitimate. You know what I mean? It's valid mm. AF. Mm. Yeah, dude, it's, it's honestly, dude, next year has the capacity to be the best year for Bellator, like, top to bottom. And, and I, I think can't wait till they sign Kevin Lee, dude. Uh, apparently they said they're not interested, but they've said that before, and then they've signed people, so it's probably just negotiation. Exactly. They did that with Yoel Romero. I remember he, that Scott Cook was like, no, nah, we're good, we're good. And they signed Yoel, and I mean, so <laughs> look at that signing turned out so far. But you know, um, regardless, dude, they have such. That's another guy, dude. Yoel, uh, Rumble Johnson. Hopefully, we get that fight next year, dude. Like they have. Hope so Rumble gets much. better soon. Yeah, hope so. I, I haven't heard anything. Like I've heard he's just recovering. So obviously, we don't know what's going on. But um, you know, just hope for the best for him, honestly. But we'll go ahead and see, dude. We'll go ahead and see what happens. Um, Baltimore has, the, like I said, the capacity to have 2022 be, be their best year by far. Um, so yeah, man, is there anything else we can talk about on just MMA, boxing, anything else before we close out? Uh, I like specifically, I mean, we have Loma fighting this week, but I mean, you know how that's going to go, Josh. No disrespect to Richard Comey. <laughs> yeah, Richard Comey's a tough guy, but that's a, that's a rough matchup for him, my man. That's a very rough, very rough matchup for him. Um, but yeah, dude, there's actually a lot of, a lot of, um, just boxing this week, but nothing really insane that we really need to talk about. But yeah, dude, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun week for MMA boxing. I think next week is kind of like the big one. Um, it's weird, right? Yeah, it's pretty weird. Um, Jesus, dude, Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley, too. Obviously, we didn't talk about that on the show, but that that was announced because Tom Fury was out due to injury. So, you know, and, and but normally we'd give our impressions of that because the fight is so close. Probably just gonna wait till next week, but yeah, dude, it's a big one. It's a big one next week. Um, obviously, you see, we'll have tons of stuff to talk about next week. Obviously, year's closing out a little bit quiet due to the lack of shows, like MMA shows, but we'll we'll give you guys some content as well. So don't worry about that. Um, yeah, man, fun stuff, fun stuff. I uh, hope you guys enjoy this this podcast as always. I'm at Josh Shogun on Twitter. He's at Andrew Tigger underscore one. I was able to get the handle at Courtside Sound, so we're no longer at Courtside Sound one. We're at Courtside Sound. Wait on uh, Twitter? Call. Yeah. Well, how'd you get that? Did you get to pay for that? No. <laughs> for it was some reason, it was just available. available. I'm not sure if like the former account closed down or something, but yeah, it was available. So we're at Courtside Sound now. So, um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed as always. Feel free to go and subscribe. Give us all that fun stuff. We'll be back next week. Peace and butt grease. Mouse click.